Western and Russian analysts use the term Putinism to characterize the ideology, priorities, and policies of Vladimir Putin and his system of government. Cassidy and Johnson argue that since taking power in 1999, Putin has inspired expressions of adulation the likes of which Russia has not seen since the days of Stalin. Tributes to his achievements and personal attributes have flooded every possible media. Ross says the cult emerged quickly by 2002 and emphasizes Putin's iron will, health, youth and decisiveness, tempered by popular support. Ross concludes, the development of a Putin mini-cult of personality was based on a formidable personality at its heart. Overview, the term occurs, often with negative connotations in Western media, in reference to the political system of Russia during the period of the Putin presidencies and of Putin's interim prime ministership where Solovki control much of the political and financial powers. Many of these people, with a state security background and 22 governmental security and intelligence agencies, shared their career background with Putin or are his personal friends. The political system under Putin features some elements of economic liberalism, a lack of transparency in governance, cronyism and pervasive corruption, which assumed in Putin's Russia a systemic and institutionalized form, according to a report by Boris Nemtsov as well as according to other sources. Between 1999 and autumn 2008 Russia's economy grew at a steady pace, which some experts attribute to the sharp ruble devaluation of 1998. Boris Yeltsin-era structural reforms, to a rising oil price and to cheap credit from Western banks. In Michael McFall's opinion, Russia Euro unregistered trademark SA Euro OE impress IV a Euro short-term economic growth came simultaneously with the destruction of free media, threats to civil society and an unmitigated corruption of justice. During his two terms as president, Putin signed into law a series of liberal economic reforms such as the flat income tax of 13%, a reduced profits tax, a new land code and a new edition of the civil code. Within this period, poverty in Russia reduced by more than half and real GDP has grown rapidly. In foreign affairs, the Putin government seeks to emulate the former Soviet Union's grandeur, belligerence and expansionism. In November 2007, Simon Tisdall of The Guardian pointed out that just as Russia once exported Marxist revolution, it may now be creating an international market for Putinism, as more often than not, instinctively undemocratic, oligarchic and corrupt national elites find that an appearance of democracy, with parliamentary trappings and a pretense of pluralism, is much more attractive, and manageable, than the real thing. The U.S. economist Richard W. Rahn called Putinism a Russian nationalistic authoritarian form of government that pretends to be a free market democracy, and which owes more of its lineage to fascism than communism. Noting that Putinism depended on the Russian economy growing rapidly enough that most people had rising standards of living and, in exchange, were willing to put up with the existing soft repression, he predicted that as Russia's economic fortunes changed. Putinism was likely to become more repressive. Russian historian Andranik Magranyan saw the Putin regime as restoring what he viewed as the natural functions of a government after period of the 1990s, when oligopolies expressing only their own narrow interests allegedly ruled Russia. Magranyan said, if democracy is the rule by a majority and the protection of the rights and opportunities of a minority, the current political regime can be described as democratic, at least formally. A multi-party political system exists in Russia, while several parties, most of them representing the opposition, have seats in the State Duma. Putin's campaign program On December 31, 1999, President Boris Yeltsin resigned. Under the Constitution of Russia, the then Prime Minister of Russia Vladimir Putin became acting president. The day before a program article signed by Putin Russia at the turn of the millennium was published on the government website. The potential head of the state expressed his views on the past and problems of the country. The first task in Putin's view was consolidation of Russia's society, the fruitful and creative work, which our country needs so badly, is impossible in a divided and internally atomized society. However, the author stressed that there should be no forced civil accord in a democratic Russia. Social accord can only be voluntary. The author stressed the importance of strengthening the state, 
The key to Russia Euro unregistered trademark s recovery and growth today lies in the state political sphere. Russia needs strong state power and must have it. Detailing on his view Putin emphasized, strong state power in Russia is a democratic, law-based, workable federal state. Regarding the economic problems, Putin pointed out the need to significantly improve economic efficiency, the need of carrying out the coherent and result-based social policy aimed to battle the poverty and the need to provide the stable growth of people's well-being. The article stated the importance of government support of science, education, culture, healthcare, since a country in which the people are not healthy physically and psychologically, are poorly educated and illiterate, will never rise to the peaks of world civilization. The article concluded with an alarmist statement that Russia was in the midst of one of the most difficult periods in its history, for the first time in the past 200 a Euro 300 years, it is facing the real threat of slipping down to the second, and possibly even third, rank of world states. To avoid that, there's a need of tremendous effort of all the intellectual, physical and moral forces of the nation. Because everything depends on us, and us alone, on our ability to recognize the scale of the threat, to unite and apply ourselves to lengthy and hard work. As stated in the history course by Russian doctors of history Barsenkov and Vdovin, the basic ideas of the article were represented in the election platform of Vladimir Putin and supported by the majority of country's citizens, leading to the victory of Vladimir Putin in the first round of the 2000 election, with 52% of the votes cast. The outline of Russia's foreign policy was presented by Vladimir Putin in his address to Russia's Federal Assembly in April 2002, We are building constructive, normal relations with all the world's nations a euro I want to emphasize, with all the world's nations. However, I want to note something else, the norm in the international community, in the world today, is also harsh competition a euro for markets, for investment, for political and economic influence. And in this fight, Russia needs to be strong and competitive. I want to stress that Russian foreign policy will in the future be organized in a strictly pragmatic way, based on our capabilities and national interests military and strategic, economic and political. And also taking into account the interests of our partners, above all in the CIS. In his 2008 book, the Russian political commentator, the retired KGB Lieutenant General Nikolai Leonov, noted that Putin's program article was barely noticed then and never revisited later a euro a fact that Leonov regretted, because its content is most important for contrasting against his, Putin's, subsequent actions, and thus figuring out Putin's pattern, under which words, more often than not, do not match his actions. Sociological data, according to Dr. Mark Smith, some of the main features of Putin's regime were, development of a corporatist system by pursuing close ties with business organizations, social stability and co-optation of opposition parties. He determined three main groupings in Putin's early leadership, one, the Solovki, 2. Economic liberals and 3. Supporters of the family, that is those who were close to Yeltsin. Olga Kshtanovskaya, who carried out a sociological survey in 2004, put the relative number of Solovki in the Russian political elite at 25%. In Putin's inner circle, which constitutes about 20 people, amount of Soloviks rises to 58%, and fades to 18 a euro 20% in parliament and 34% in the government. According to Kshtanovskaya, there was no capture of power as Kremlin bureaucracy has called Soloviks in order to restore order. The process of Soloviks coming into power has allegedly started since 1996, Boris Yeltsin's second term. Not personally Yeltsin, but the whole elite wish to stop the revolutionary process and consolidate the power. When Solovik Vladimir Putin was appointed prime minister in 1999, the process boosted. According to Olga, yes, Putin has brought Soloviks with him. But that's not enough to understand the situation. Here's also an objective aspect, the whole political class wished them to come. They were called for service, there was a need of a strong arm, capable from point of view of the elite to establish order in the country. Kshtanovskaya noted that there were also people who had worked in structures believed to be affiliated with the KGB FSB such as the Soviet Union Ministry of Foreign Affairs, 
Governmental Communications Commission, Ministry of Foreign Trade, Press Agency News and others. The work per se in such agencies would not necessarily involve contacts with security services, but would make it likely. Summing up the numbers of official and affiliated Silovki, she came up with an estimate of 77% of such in the power. According to Russian Public Opinion Foundation 2005 investigation, 34% of respondents think there is a lack of democracy in Russia because democratic rights and freedoms are not observed, and also point on the lack of law and order. In the same time, 21% of respondents are sure there's too much of democracy in Russia. Many of them point on the same drawbacks as the previous group, the lack of law and order, irresponsibility and non-accountability of politicians. According to the foundation, as we can see, Russians' negative opinions about democracy are based on their dissatisfaction with contemporary conditions, while some respondents think the democratic model is not suitable in principle. Considering the modern regime, it is interesting that most respondents think Putin's government marks the most democratic epoch in Russian history, while second place goes to Brezhnev's times. Some people mentioned Gorbachev and Yeltsin in this context. At the end of 2008, Lev Gukov, based on the Levada Center polling data, pointed out the near disappearance of public opinion as a socio political institution in Putin's Russia and its replacement with a still efficacious state propaganda. Economic Policies, July 9, 2000, in speaking to Parliament, Putin advocated economy policies that introduced flat tax rate of 13%. The corporate rate of tax was also reduced from 35% to 24%. Small businesses also get better treatment. The old system with high tax rates has been replaced by a new system where companies can choose either a 6% tax on gross revenue or a 15% tax on profits. In February 2009, Putin called for a single VAT rate to be as low as possible it could be reduced to between 12% and 13%. Overall tax burden was lower in Russia under Putin than in most European countries. Rising living standards, in 2005, Putin launched national priority projects in the fields of healthcare, education, housing and agriculture. In his May 2006 annual speech, Putin proposed increasing maternity benefits and prenatal care for women. Putin was strident about the need to reform the judiciary considering the present federal judiciary Sovietesk, wherein many of the judges hand down the same verdicts as they would under the old Soviet judiciary structure, and preferring instead a judiciary that interpreted and implemented the code to the current situation. In 2005, Responsibility for federal prisons was transferred from the Ministry of Internal Affairs to the Ministry of Justice. The most high-profile change within the national priority project frameworks was probably the 2006 across-the-board increase in wages in healthcare and education, as well as the decision to modernize equipment in both sectors in 2006 and 2007. During Putin's government, poverty was cut more than half and real GDP has grown rapidly. Andrew Summers President of the American Chamber of Commerce in Russia in 2007 article has emphasized the influence of American private investments for Russian democracy, as well as the amount of local support for them. In a nutshell, the booming Russian economy is transforming the nation's outlook, standard of living and opportunities for its people in ways that were unimaginable only five years ago. More than 10 million Russian citizens have traveled abroad. Private enterprises thriving. Russians are happier healthier and more optimistic than ever in their lives. And, contrary to what you might hear, surveys show that the Russian people are as pro-American, if not more so, than the populations of many a European country, and most hope for closer relations with the United States. He also said, I would argue that the American business community has played a not insignificant role in fostering these developments. By their willingness to invest in Russia's future, American companies have become effective ambassadors for the United States and its values, while creating new jobs and benefiting the economies of both our countries. And the Putin government has been supportive of these efforts in ways that some might find surprising. Russian officials go to considerable lengths to be cooperative and accommodate the needs of American business, while at the same time revising their regulations to align them more closely with international standards.
In 2006 Chief of Business Week a Euro a Euro show Euro S Moscow Bureau Jason Bush commented on the condition of Russian middle class, this group has grown from just 8 million in 2000 to 55 million today and now accounts for some 37% of the population, estimates expert, a market research firm in Moscow. That's giving a lift to the mood in the country. The share of Russians who think life is not bad has risen to 23% from just 7% in 1999, while those who find living conditions unacceptable has dropped to 29% from 53%, according to a recent poll. However, not everyone has shared in the prosperity. Far from it. The average Russian earns $330 a month, just 10% of the U.S. average. Only a third of households own a car and mania euro particularly the elderly euro have been left behind. At the end of Putin's second term Jonathan Steele has commented on Putin's legacy. What, then, is Putin's legacy? Stability and growth, for starters. After the chaos of the 90s, highlighted by Yeltsin's attack on the Russian parliament with tanks in 1993 and the collapse of almost every bank in 1998, Putin has delivered political calm and a 7% annual rate of growth. Inequalities have increased and many of the new rich are grotesquely crass and cruel, but not all the Kremlin's vast revenues from oil and gas have gone into private pockets or are being hoarded in the government's stabilization fund. Enough has gone into modernizing schools and hospitals so that people notice a difference. Overall living standards are up. The Second Chechen War, the major blight on Putin's record, is almost over. Corporatism and state intervention in economy, according to Dr. Mark Smith, Putin's regime had developed a corporatist system in the sense that under him the Kremlin was interested in close ties with business organizations such as the Russian Union of Industrialists and Entrepreneurs, Delavera Rossiya, and the Trade Union Federation. This was a part of the regime's attempts to involve broad sectors of society in the making and implementation of policy. There is a school of thought, which says that a number of Putin's steps in the economy were signs of a shift toward a system normally described as state capitalism, where the entirety of state-owned and controlled enterprises are run by and for the benefit of the cabal around Putin the Euro a collection of former KGB colleagues, St. Petersburg lawyers, and other political cronies. According to Andrei Larionov, advisor of Vladimir Putin until 2005, Putin's regime was a new socio-political order, distinct from any seen in our country before members of the Corporation of Intelligence Service collaborators had taken over the entire body of state power, followed an OMATA-like behavior code, and were given instruments conferring power upon a Thursa Euro membership perks, such as the right to carry and use weapons. According to Ilari Onov, this corporation has seized key government agencies a Euro the tax service, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Parliament, and the government-controlled mass media Euro, which are now used to advance the interests of corporation members. Through those agencies, every significant resource in the county Euro security intelligence, political, economic, informational and financial Euro is being monopolized in the hands of corporation members, members of the corporation formed an isolated caste. According to an anonymous former KGB general cited by The Economist, a Euro OEA Czechist is a breed. A good KGB heritage a Euro a father or grandfather, say, who worked for the service a Euro is highly valued by today's Slovki. Marriages between Slovki clans are also encouraged. Jason Bush, chief of the Moscow Bureau of the magazine Businessweek has commented in December 2006 on troubling in his opinion growth of government's role. The Kremlin has taken control of some two dozen Russian companies since 2004, including oil assets from Sineft and Yukos, as well as banks, newspapers, and more. Despite his sporadic support for pro-market reforms, Putin has backed national champions such as energy concerns Gazprom and Rosneft. The private sector's share of output fell from 70% to 65% last year, while state-controlled companies now represent 38% of stock market capitalization, up from 22% a year ago. The Financial Times on September 20, 2008, when the late 2000s recession had started to hit the well-being of Russia's top tycoons, said, 
Putinism was built on the understanding that if tycoons played by Kremlin rules they would prosper. Although Russia's state intervention in the economy had been usually criticized in the West, a study by Bank of Finland's Institute for Economies in Transition in 2008 showed that state intervention had had a positive impact on the corporate governance of many companies in Russia. The formal indications of the quality of corporate governance in Russia were higher in companies with state control or with a stake held by the government. Other economic developments and assessments, in June 2008, a group of Finnish economists wrote that the 2000s had so far been an economic boon for Russia, with GDP rising about 7% a year. By the beginning of 2008, Russia had become one of the 10 largest economies in the world. In Putin's first term, Many new economic reforms were implemented along the lines of the GREF program. The multitude of reforms ranged from a flat income tax to bank reform, from land ownership to improvements in conditions for small businesses. In 1998, over 60% of industrial turnover in Russia was based on barter and various monetary surrogates. The use of such alternatives to money now today fallen out of favor, which has boosted economic productivity significantly. Besides raising wages and consumption, Putin's government has received broad praise also for eliminating this problem. In the opinion of the Finnish researchers, the most high-profile change within the national priority project frameworks was probably the 2006 across-the-board increase in wages in healthcare and education, as well as the decision to modernize equipment in both sectors in 2006 and 2007. The rise in the overall living standards further deepened Russia's social and geographical discrepancies. In July 2008, Edward Lucas of The Economist wrote, The colossal bribe-collecting opportunities created by Putinism have heightened the divide between big cities and the rest of the country. In November 2008, the retired KGB Lieutenant General Nikola Leonov, in assessing the overall results of Putin's economic policies for the period of eight years, said, within this period, there has only been one positive thing, if you leave aside the trivia. And that thing is the price of oil and natural gas. In the closing paragraphs of his 2008 book, the retired general said, behind the gilded facade of Moscow and St. Petersburg, there lies a demolished country that, under the current characteristics of those in power, has no chance to restore itself as one of the developed states of the world. On November 29, 2008, Gennady Tsyaganov, leader of the Communist Party of Russian Federation in his speech before the 13th Party Congress made these remarks about the state that Russia under Putin was in, objectively, Russia Euro unregistered trademark s position remains complicated, not to say dismal. The population is dying out. Thanks to the heroic efforts of the Yeltsinites the country has lost 5 out of the 22 million square kilometers of its historical territory. Russia has lost half of its production capacity and has yet to reach the 1990 level of output. Our country is facing three mortal dangers, deindustrialization, depopulation and mental debilitation. The ruling group has neither notable successes to boast of, nor a clear plan of action. All its activities are geared to a single goal, to stay in power at all costs. Until recently it has been able to keep in power due to the windfall high world prices for energy. Its social support rests on the notorious euro evertical power structure euro which is another way of saying intimidation and blackmail of the broad social strata and the handouts that power chips off the oil and gas pie and throws out to the population in crumbs, especially on the eve of elections. To characterize the kind of state Putin had built in socio-economic terms, in early 2008, Professor Marshall I. Goldman coined the term Petrostate Petrostate Putin, power, and the new Russia, where he in ter alia argued that while Putin had followed the advice of economic advisers in implementing reforms such as a 13% flat tax and creating a stabilization fund to lessen inflationary pressure. His main personal contribution was the idea of creating national champions, and the renationalization of major energy assets. In his June 2008 interview, Marshall Goldman said that, in his opinion, Putin had created a new class of oligarchs, whom some called Zologarchs, Russia having come in second in the Forbes magazine list of the world's billionaires after only the United States. In December 2008, 
Andres Island pointed out that Putin a Euro unregistered trademark S chief project had been to develop huge, unmanageable state-owned mastodons, considered a Euro or a national champions a Euro, which had stalemated large parts of the economy through their inertia and corruption while impeding diversification. Restoring functionality of government, the concept of Putinism was described in a positive sense by Russian political scientist Andranik Magranyan. According to Magranyan, Putin came into office when the worst regime was established, the economy was totally decentralized, and the state had lost central authority, while the oligarchs robbed the country and controlled its power institutions. In two years, Putin has restored hierarchy of power, ending the omnipotence of regional elites as well as destroying political influence of oligarchs and oligopolies in the federal center. The family, Boris Yeltsin era non-institutional center of power, was ruined, which, according to Magranyan, in turn undercut the positions of the actors, such as Boris Berezovsky and Vladimir Kuzinsky, who had sought to privatize the Russian state with all of its resources and institutions. Magranyan said, Putin began establishing common rules of the game for all actors, and started with an attempt to restore the role of the government as the institution expressing combined interests of the citizens and capable of controlling the state a Euro unregistered trademark s financial, administrative and media resources. According to Magranyan, naturally, in line with Russian traditions, any attempt to increase the state your Euro unregistered trademark S role causes an intense repulsion on the part of the liberal intellectuals, not to mention a segment of the business community that is not interested in the strengthening of state power until all of the most attractive state property has been seized. Magranyan claimed that oligopolies' view of democracy was set on a premise of whether they were close to the center of power, rather than objective characteristics and estimates of the situation in the country. Magranyan said free media, owned by for example Berezovsky and Kuzinsky, were nothing similar to free media as understood by the West, but served their only economic and political interests, while all other politicians and analysts were denied the right to go on the air. Magranyan sees enhancement of the role of the law enforcement agencies as a trial to set barriers against criminals, particularly those in big business. Magranyan sees in 2004 fruition of the social revolution initiated by Mikhail Gorbachev, whose aims were to rebuild the social system, the absolute dominance of private ownership in Russia, recognized by all political forces today, has been the greatest achievement and result of this social revolution. The major trouble of Russian democracy, according to Magranyan, is inability of civil society to rule the state, under development of public interests. He sees that as the consequence of Yeltsin's era family-ruled state being unable to pursue a favorable environment for mid-sized and small businesses. Magranyan sees modern Russia as democracy, at least formally. While the state, having restored its effectiveness and control over its own resources, has become the largest corporation responsible for establishing the rules of the game, Magranyan wonders how much might this influence extend in future. In 2004 he saw two possibilities for the Putin regime, either transformation into a consolidated democracy either bureaucratic authoritarianism. However, if Russia is lagging behind the developed capitalist nations in regard to the consolidation of democracy, it is not the quality of democracy, but rather its amount and the balance between civil society and the state. The report by Andrew C. Kuchins in November 2007 said, Russia today is a hybrid regime that might best be termed a Euro or April internationalism, a Euro although neither word is fully accurate and requires considerable qualification. From being a weakly institutionalized, fragile, and in many ways distorted proto-democracy in the 1990s, Russia under Vladimir Putin has moved back in the direction of a highly centralized authoritarianism, which has characterized the state for most of its 1,000-year history but it is an authoritarian state where the consent of the governed is essential. Given the experience of the 1990s and the Kremlin Euro unregistered trademark as propaganda emphasizing this period as one of chaos, economic collapse, and international humiliation, the Russian people have no great enthusiasm for democracy and remain politically apathetic in light of the extraordinary economic recovery and improvement in lifestyles for so many over the last eight years. The emergent, highly centralized government, combined with a weak and submissive society, 
is the hallmark of traditional Russian paternalism. In a 2007 interview with Der Spiegel, Alex Ansolz Henson commented on the Putin regime, Putin has inherited plundered and downtrodden country with demoralized and grown poor majority of the population. And he took on its possible a euro to be noted, gradual, slower euro recovering. These efforts were not right at the moment noticed, not speaking about being appreciated. And can you point on examples in history when measures for recovering strength of governmental management would be benevolently met from beyond the country? According to a 2007 article of Dmitry Symes, published in Foreign Affairs, with high energy prices, sound fiscal policies, and tamed oligarchs, the Putin regime no longer needs international loans or economic assistance and has no trouble attracting major foreign investment despite growing tension with Western governments. Within Russia, relative stability, prosperity, and a new sense of dignity have tempered popular disillusionment with growing state control and the heavy-handed manipulation of the political process. BBC diplomatic correspondent Bridget Kendall in her 2007 article, after describing the scar decade of the 1990s with rampant hyperinflation, harsh Yeltsin's policies, population decrease rate like that for a nation in a war, the country turning from superpower into bigger, wonders, so who can blame Russians for welcoming the relative stability Putin has presided over during the past seven years, even if other aspects of his rule have cast an authoritarian shadow. In the back-to-front world of Russian politics, it is not too little democracy that many people fear, but too much of it. This, I discovered, is why some are calling for Putin to stay on for a third term. Not because they admire him a euro privately, many say that he and his cronies are just as corrupt and disdainful of others as their communist predecessors are a euro, but because they mistrust the idea of democracy, resent the West for pushing it, and fear what might happen as a result of next year's elections. Recent experience has taught them that change is usually for the worse and best avoided. Authoritarian bureaucratic state Russian politician Boris Nemtsov and commentator Kara Mertsa define Putinism in Russia as a one-party system, censorship, a puppet parliament, ending of an independent judiciary, firm centralization of power and finances, and hypertrophied role of special services and bureaucracy, in particular in relation to business. Russia's nascent middle class showed few signs of political activism under the regime, as Masha Lipman reported, as with the majority overall, those in the middle income group have accepted the paternalism of Vladimir Putin's government and remained apolitical and apathetic. In December 2007, the Russian sociologist Igor Edman categorized the Putin regime as the power of bureaucratic oligarchy which had the traits of extreme right-wing dictatorship a euro the dominance of state monopoly capital in the economy, Silovoki structures in governance, clericalism and statism in ideology. In August 2008, The Economist wrote about the virtual demise of both Russian and Soviet intelligentsia in post-Soviet Russia and noted, Putinism was made strong by the absence of resistance from the part of society that was meant to provide intellectual opposition. In early February 2009, Alexander Rosan, an economist and board member at a research institute set up by Dmitry Medvedev, said that in the Putin system, there is not a relationship between the authorities and the people through parliament or through non-profit organizations or other structures. The relationship to the people is basically through television. And under the conditions of the crisis, that can no longer work. About the same time, Vladimir Rizhkov pointed out that a bill Medvedev had sent to the State Duma in late January 2009, when signed into law, will allow Kremlin-friendly regional legislatures to remove opposition mayors who were elected by popular vote. It is no coincidence that Medvedev has taken aim at the country's mayors. Mayoral elections were the last bastion of direct elections after the Duma cancelled the popular vote for governors in 2005. Independent mayors were the only source of political competition against governors who were loyal to the Kremlin and united Russia. Now one of the few remaining checks and balances against the monopoly on executive power in the regions will be removed. After the law is signed by Medvedev, the power vertical will be extended one step further to reach every mayor in the country. Rehabilitation of the Tsarist Imperial and of the Soviet past of Russia. Equals Tsarist Imperial Russia equals 
Vladimir Putin models himself on the Tsar Peter the Great, whose reign is reminiscent of a Russian imperial greatness which the Kremlin is keen to promote. In keeping with the Kremlin's heartfelt nostalgia for the former monarchy, a presidential commission asked Vladimir Putin, in 2003, to grant the request of one of Nicholas II's last surviving relatives, to rehabilitate the House of Romanov. Willing to regain the imperial grandeur of Russia, Putin invited the Romanov royal family to return to Russia, in July 2015. According to the presidential commission, this move would represent a significant final step in Russia's journey to embrace its Tsarist history. An alliance has been forged, between the Church and the Kremlin, since Vladimir Putin became the president of the Russian Federation. Vladimir Putin, a proud adherent of the Russian Orthodox Church, has allowed the regaining by the Orthodox Church of much of the importance that the Church had enjoyed during the era of the Tsarism, and has won the enthusiastic support of its religious leaders. Equals Soviet Union equals, the first politically controversial step made by Putin, then the FSB director, was restoring in June 1999 a memorial plaque to Yuri Andropov on the facade of the building, where the KGB had been headquartered. In late 2000, Putin submitted a bill to the State Duma to use the Soviet anthem as Russia's national anthem. The Duma voted in favor. In April, 2005, in his formal address to Russia's parliament, President Putin famously said, above all, we should acknowledge that the collapse of the Soviet Union was a major geopolitical disaster of the century. As for the Russian nation, it became a genuine drama. Tens of millions of our co-citizens and compatriots found themselves outside Russian territory. Moreover, the epidemic of disintegration infected Russia itself. In September 2003, Putin was quoted as saying, The Soviet Union is a very complicated page in the history of our peoples. It was heroic and constructive, and it was also tragic. But it is a page that has been turned. It's over, the boat has sailed. Now we need to think about the present and the future of our peoples. In February 2004, Putin said, It is my deep conviction that the dissolution of the Soviet Union was a national tragedy on a massive scale. I think the ordinary citizens of the former Soviet Union and the citizens in the post-Soviet space, the CIS countries, have gained nothing from it. On the contrary, people have been faced with a host of problems. He went on to say, incidentally, at the period too, opinions varied, including among the leaders of the Union republics. For example, Nair Sultan Nazarbayev was categorically opposed to the dissolution of the Soviet Union and he said so openly proposing various formulas for preserving the state within the common borders. But, I repeat, all that is in the past. Today we should look at the situation in which we live. One cannot keep looking back and fretting about it, we should look forward. In December 2007, he said in the interview to The Time magazine, Russia is an ancient country with historical, profound traditions and a very powerful moral foundation. And this foundation is a love for the motherland and patriotism. Patriotism in the best sense of that word. Incidentally, I think that to a certain extent, to a significant extent, this is also attributable to the American people. In August 2008, The Economist claimed, Russia today is ruled by the KGB elite, has a Soviet anthem, servile media, corrupt courts and a rubber-stamping parliament. A new history textbook proclaims that the Soviet Union, although not a democracy, was an example for millions of people around the world of the best and fairest society. Vladimir Putin has said that Stalin's legacy can't be judged in black and white in 2009. Although Putin's policies have been likened to the Soviet era by many people, he also has received a lukewarm response by Gennady Tsyaganov, the leader of Communist Party of the Russian Federation, KPRF. Roger Boys, on the other hand, considers him more of a latter-day Brezhnev than a clone of Stalin. In November, 2008, International Herald Tribune stated, The Kremlin in the Putin era has often sought to maintain as much sway over the portrayal of history as over the governance of the country. In seeking to restore Russia's standing, Putin and other officials have stoked a nationalism that glorifies Soviet triumphs while playing down or even whitewashing the system's horrors. As a result, 
Throughout Russia, many archives detailing killings, persecution and other such acts committed by the Soviet authorities have become increasingly off-limits. The role of the security services seems especially delicate, perhaps because Putin is a former KGB agent who headed the agency's successor, the FSB, in the late 1990s. State-sponsored global peer effort, shortly after the Bell and Terror Act in September 2004. Putin enhanced a Kremlin-sponsored program aimed at improving Russia's image abroad. According to an unnamed former Duma deputy, there existed a classified article in the IRF federal budget that provided for financing measures to this purpose. One of the major projects of the program was the creation in 2005 of Russia Today Our Euro a rolling English-language TV news channel providing 24-hour news coverage, modeled on CNN. Towards its startup budget, $30 million of public funds were allocated. A CBS News story on the launch of Russia Today quoted Boris Kajalitsky as saying it was very much a continuation of the old Soviet propaganda services. In 2007, Russia Today employed nearly 100 English-speaking special correspondents worldwide. Russia's Deputy Foreign Minister Grigory Karazin said in August 2008, in the context of the Russia-Georgia conflict, Western media is a well-organized machine, which is showing only those pictures that fit in well with their thoughts. We find it very difficult to squeeze our opinion into the pages of their newspapers. Similar views were expressed by some Western commentators. William Dunbar, who was reporting then for Russia Today from Georgia, said he had not been on air since he mentioned Russian bombing of targets inside Georgia on August 9, 2008 and had to resign over what he claimed was biased coverage by the outlet. Variety magazine quoted an unnamed senior journalist with Russia Today as saying, My view is that Russia Today is not particularly biased at all. When you look at the Western media, there is a lot of genuflection towards the powers that be. Russian news coverage is largely pro-Russia, but that is to be expected. The prairie efforts notwithstanding, According to an opinion poll released in February 2009 by the BBC World Service, Russia's image around the world had taken a dramatic dive in 2008. 42% of respondents said they had a mainly negative view of Russia, according to the poll, which surveyed more than 13,000 people in 21 countries in December and January. In June 2007, Vido Mosti reported that the Kremlin had been intensifying its official lobbying activities in the United States since 2003, among other things hiring such companies as Hornayford Enterprises and Ketchum. However, the negative image of Russia might be at least partly due to an alleged anti-Russian bias in the West's perceptions. According to Dr. Vlad Sobel, an example of the anti-Russian bias in the West was the fact that President Putin was widely assumed to be guilty of the murder of Alexander Litvinenko, without any evidence being considered as necessary. The only proof the Western press needed for Putin's guilt was, that the victim said so himself on his deathbed. Sobol furthermore asks, why is Russia portrayed as a euro resurgent and aggressive power, when it merely reacts defensively to encirclement by NATO? Why is Gazprom, and consequently the Kremlin, accused of gas blackmail, when it merely withholds supplies due to the non-payment of debts? Why is Russia deemed to have no independent media, when in fact it has a very thriving free press? Why is Russia's spectacular economic recovery constantly ridiculed as being the result of little else but high hydrocarbon prices? In April 2007 David Johnson, founder of the Johnson's Russia List said in interview to the Moscow News colon I am sympathetic to the view that these days Putin and Russia are perhaps getting too dark a portrayal in most Western media. Or at least that critical views need to be supplemented with other kinds of information and analysis. An openness to different views is still warranted. Paramount leadership or tan democracy? The 2008 power switching operation between Putin and Medvedev was widely seen as a pro forma action after the constitution didn't allow Putin to be re elected for a third term in the 2008 presidential election. However, both scholars and the Russian population disagree on whether the course of the operation highlighted the paramount leadership of Putin, with Medvedev being just a mascot or if it represented what was called a tan democracy between the two. Criticism equals personality cult equals
Russia has developed a personality cult around Vladimir Putin. In the course of his career, Putin has encouraged an inclusive form of Russian nationalism, become the model Russian man, brought the media to its knees, redeemed Joseph Stalin and reconciled the Soviet past. In June 2001, the BBC noted that a year after Putin took office, the Russian media had been reflecting on what some saw as a growing personality cult around him. Russia's TV6 television had shown a vast choice of portraits of Putin on sale at a shopping mall in an underground passage near Moscow's Park of Culture. Simultaneously, human rights groups voiced concerns about what they saw as a revival of the personality cult of Stalin, who became the subject of an exhibition that opened at a Moscow museum in 2003 to celebrate the 50th anniversary of his death. On August 22, 2007, the International Herald Tribune, in connection with the host of gossip and speculation that ensued after Putin stripped off his shirt for the cameras while on holiday with Prince Albert II of Monaco in the Altai Mountains, quoted Sergei Markov, Kremlin-connected head of the Moscow-based Institute for Political Research as saying, he's cool. That's been the image throughout the presidency, cool. In October 2007, the Russian weekly Obshchei Gazeta reported that according to the polls there were an increasing number of people in Russia who either believed there existed Putin's personality cult, or saw the conditions for same. Only 38% denied the existence of the personality cult in October, compared to 49% in April that year. In October 2007, some scenes at the United Russia Congress caused Belarus President Alexander Lukashenko who was allied to Russia within the Union state, to recall the Soviet times, complete with the official adoration towards the Communist Party leader. Talking to Russia's regional press representatives he said that in Russia Putin's personality cult was being created. About the same time, AFP reported that ahead of the December parliamentary and March presidential elections, in which Putin, despite being required by the constitution to leave office, was widely expected to find some way to retain power, his personality cult was gathering pace. After Medvedev was elected president in March 2008, Radio Liberty reported that during his eight-year presidency, Putin had managed to build a personality cult around himself similar to those created by Soviet leaders. Although there had not been giant statues of Putin put up across the country, he had the honor of being the only Russian leader to have had a pop song written about him, I Want a Man Like Putin, which hit the charts in 2002. Equals FSB influence equals. According to some scholars, Russia under Putin has been transformed into an FSB state. Shortly after becoming Russian Prime Minister, Putin was reported to have joked to a group of his KGB associates. A group of FSB colleagues dispatched to work undercover in the government has successfully completed its first mission. The former Securitate Lieutenant General and Defector Ion Mayai Paspa said in his interview for Conservative Front Page magazine in 2006 that former KGB officers are running Russia, and that FSB, which he called the KGB successor had the right to monitor the population electronically, control political process, search private property, cooperate with employees of the federal government, create front enterprises, investigate cases, and run its own prisons. Various 2006 estimates showed that Russia had above 200,000 members of the FSB, or one FSB employee for every 700 citizens of Russia. The Russian Armed Forces General Staff, as well as its subordinate structures, such as the Russian Strategic Missile Troops Headquarters, are not submitted to the Federal Security Service, but the FSB might be interested in monitoring such structures, as they intrinsically involve state secrets and various degrees of admittance to them. The Law on Federal Security Service which defines its functions and establishes its structure does not involve such tasks as managing strategic branches of national industry, controlling political groups, or infiltrating the federal government. The political scientist Julie Anderson in 2006 wrote, Under Russian Federation President and former career foreign intelligence officer Vladimir Putin, an FSB state composed of Czechists has been established and is consolidating its hold on the country. Its closest partners are organized criminals. In a world marked by a globalized economy and information infrastructure, 
and with transnational terrorism groups utilizing all available means to achieve their goals and further their interests, Russian intelligence collaboration with these elements is potentially disastrous. The Russian historian Yuri Felshtinsky compared the takeover of the Russian state by the Solovki to an imaginary scenario of the Gestapo coming to power in Germany after World War II. He pointed out a fundamental difference between the secret police and ordinary political parties, even totalitarian ones, such as the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Russia's secret police organizations are want to employ the so called active measures and extrajudicial killings. Hence, they killed Alexander Litvinenko and directed Russian apartment bombings and other terrorism acts in Russia to frighten the civilian population and achieve their political objectives, according to Flustinsky. In April 2006, Raoul Mark Jerecht, a former Middle East specialist at the Central Intelligence Agency, presented a list of those who had mysteriously died during Putin's presidency and wrote, Vladimir Putin's Russia is a new phenomenon in Europe, a state defined and dominated by former and active duty security and intelligence officers. Not even fascist Italy, Nazi Germany, or the Soviet Union a Euro all undoubtedly much worse creations than Russia a Euro were as top-heavy with intelligence talent. There is no historical precedent for a society so dominated by former and active duty internal security and intelligence officials a Euro men who rose up in a professional culture in which murder could be an acceptable, even obligatory, business practice. Those who operated within the Soviet sphere were the most malevolent in their practices. These men mentored and shaped Putin and his closest friends and allies. It is therefore unsurprising that Putin's Russia has become an assassination happy state where detention, interrogation, and torture a Euro all tried and true methods of the Soviet KGB a Euro are used to silence the voices of untoward journalists and businessmen who annoy or threaten Putin's FSB state. One of the leading members of Putin's ruling elite, Nikolai Patrushev. Director of the Federal Security Service of the Russian Federation and, subsequently, Secretary of the Security Council of Russia, was known for his propagation of the idea of Czechists as neo aristocrats. A report by Andrew C. Kuchins in November 2007 said The predominance of the intelligence services and mentality is a core feature of Putin, the Euro unregistered trademark S. Russia that marks a major and critical discontinuity from not only the 1990s but all of Soviet and Russian history. During the Soviet period, the Communist Party provided the glue holding the system together. During the 1990s, there was no central organizing institution or ideology. Now, with Putin, it is a Euro or a former Euro KGB professionals who dominate the Russian ruling elite. This is a special kind of brotherhood, a mafia-like culture in which only a few can be trusted. The working culture is secretive and non-transparent. Equals cronyism and corruption equals. In 2000, Russia's political analyst Andrei Piantkovsky called Putinism the highest and culminating stage of bandit capitalism in Russia. He said, Russia is not corrupt. Corruption is what happens in all countries when businessmen offer officials large bribes for favors. Today our Euro unregistered trademark S. Russia is unique. The businessmen, the politicians, and the bureaucrats are the same people. They have privatized the county Euro unregistered trademark S. Wealth and taken control of its financial flows. The Russian investigative journalist Anna Politkovskaya, in concluding her book A Russian Diary, said, our state authorities today are only interested in making money. That is literally all they are interested in. Such views were shared by politologist Julie Anderson who said the same person can be a Russian intelligence officer, an organized criminal, and a businessman, who quoted the former CIA director James Wolsey as saying, I have been particularly concerned for some years, beginning during my tenure, with the interpenetration of Russian organized crime, Russian intelligence and law enforcement, and Russian business. I have often illustrated this point with the following hypothetical, if you should chance to strike up a conversation with an articulate, English-speaking Russian in, say, the restaurant of one of the luxury hotels along Lake Geneva, and he is wearing a $3,000 suit and a pair of Gucci loafers, and he tells you that he is an executive of a Russian trading company and wants to talk to you about a joint venture, then there are four possibilities. He may be what he says he is. 
He may be a Russian intelligence officer working under commercial cover. He may be part of a Russian organized crime group. But the really interesting possibility is that he may be all three and that none of those three institutions have any problem with the arrangement. According to the political scientist Dmitry Glinsky, the idea of Russia, incorporated a euro, or better, Russia, limited a euro derives from the Russian brand of libertarian anarchism viewing the state as just another private armed gang claiming special rights on the basis of its unusual power. This is a state conceived as a stationary bandit imposing stability by eliminating the roving bandits of the previous era. In April 2006, Putin himself expressed extreme irritation about the de facto privatization of the customs sphere, where smart officials and entrepreneurs merged in ecstasy. According to the estimates published in Putin and Gazprom by Boris Nemtsov and Vladimir Milov, Putin and his friends pilfered assets of $80 billion from Gazprom during his second term as president. On February 29, 2009, the Russian billionaire Alexander Lebedev claimed that Prime Minister Vladimir Putin's strategy for economic recovery was based on cronyism and was fueling corruption. He also said, We have two Putins. There are lots of words, but the system doesn't work. Ideology Political scientist Irina Pavlova said that Czechists were not merely a corporation of people united to expropriate financial assets. They had long-standing political objectives of transforming Moscow to the Third Rome and an ideology of containing the United States. Columnist George Will emphasized in 2003 the nationalistic nature of Putinism, Putinism is becoming a toxic brew of nationalism directed against neighboring nations, and populist envy backed by assaults of state power, directed against private wealth. Putinism is a form of national socialism without the demonic element of its pioneer. According to Ilari Onov, the ideology of Czechists is Nashism, the selective application of rights. According to Dmitry Trenin, head of the Moscow Carnegie Center, the then Russia was one of the least ideological countries around the world, ideas hardly matter, whereas interests reign supreme. It is not surprising then that the worldview of Russian elites is focused on financial interests. Their practical deeds in fact declare in capital we trust. Trenin described Russia's elite involved in the process of policymaking as people who largely owned the country. Most of them were not public politicians, but the majority were bureaucratic capitalists. According to Trenin, having survived in a ruthless domestic business and political environment, Russian leaders are well adjusted to rough competition and will take that mindset to the world stage. However, Trenin called Russian Western relations, from Moscow's perspective, competitive, but not antagonistic. He said, Russia does not crave world domination, and its leaders do not dream of restoring the Soviet Union. He planned to rebuild Russia as a great power with a global reach, organized as a super corporation. According to Trenin, Russians no longer recognize U.S. or European moral authority a euro that is, values gap. He said, from the Russian perspective, there is no absolute freedom anywhere in the world, no perfect democracy, and no government that does not lie to its people. In essence, all are equal by virtue of sharing the same imperfections. Some are more powerful than others, however, and that is what really counts. The Russian political scientist Gleb Pavlovsky believed that Putin builds the world's Russia as opposed to a nation-state such as Alexander Lukashenko's Belarus. According to Pavlovsky, Russia's power had to be a Model 1, that is the power that would offer itself to others as a kind of a model to emulate. Equals relation to Stalinism equals. In May 2000, The Guardian wrote, when a band of former Soviet dissidents declared in February that Putinism was nothing short of modernized Stalinism, they were widely dismissed as hysterical prophets of doom. Authoritarianism is growing harsher, society is being militarized, the military budget is increasing, they warned, before calling on the West to re-examine its attitude towards the Kremlin leadership, to cease indulging it in its barbaric actions, its dismantlement of democracy and suppression of human rights. In the light of Putin's actions during his first days in power, their warnings have gained an uneasy new resonance. In February 2007, Arnold Bachman, a conservative research fellow at the Hoover Institution, 
wrote in the Washington Times that Putinism in the 21st century has become as significant a watchword as Stalinism was in the 20th. Lionel Boehner, formerly a senior writer for the Council on Foreign Relations, also in 2007, maintained that on Putin's watch, nostalgia for Stalin had grown, even among young Russians. Russians' neo-Stalinism manifesting itself in several ways. In February 2007, responding to a listener's assertion that Putin had steered the country to Stalinism, and all entrepreneurs were being jailed in Russia, the Russian opposition radio host Yevhenia Albat said, Come on, this is not true. There is no Stalinism, no concentration camps a euro thankfully. She went on to say that if citizens of the country would not be critical of what was occurring around them, referring to the orchestrated, or genuine, calls for the Tsar to stay on, that could blaze the trail for very ugly things and a very tough regime in our country. Vladimir Putin has said that Stalin's legacy can't be judged in black and white in 2009. Although Putin's policies have been likened to the Soviet era by many people, but he also has received a lukewarm response by Gennady Tsyaganov, the leader of the Russian Communist Party. Roger Boyce considers Putin more of a latter-day Brezhnev than a clone of Stalin. See also, Recovery and Growth of the Russian Economy, Russian Oligarchs, Yeltsinism, Sovereign Democracy, Neo-Sovietism, Eurasianism, Mafia State, Freedom of the Press in Russia, Freedom of Assembly in Russia, United Russia, Russian Opposition, Cult of Personality. References External links, Putinism, the Ideology A Euro 120 Lecture by Professor Anne Applebaum Spoken in London School of Economics and Political Science, recorded on Monday 28 January 2013. Putinism and Russian Protest A Euro 200 Panel Lecture Discussion in University of California Television, published on October 29, 2012. Can Putin Contain Post-Putinism? A Euro 120 Lecture at ICDS published on November 28, 2012. The A Euro OE Putinist a Proak a Euro and a Euro OE half-hearted a Euro European Union a Euro Ukraine is a story of a A Euro OE love triangle a Euro of a beautiful lady being loved by two men a Euro December 4, 2013, by Aga Iqra Haroon.